uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to come and speak. Uh, today I'm going to talk for the next 20 minutes or so uh, on this. It's very much a pilot project at this stage, just to kind of introduce you to the aims of the project and some of the initial observations, if you like. Uh, daily activities and resource use in Neolithic Orkney microarchaeology at the Nessa Broadcare. Now, I'm sure this is a, a site that probably doesn't need uh, too much introduction for most of you. Uh, it's located, obviously, uh, up in Orkney, uh, mainland Orkney, uh, near to the, the town of Stromness, out here on the peninsula. Um, it's part of uh, the Ring of Brodka World Heritage Site. Uh, and excavations have actually been, go uh, actually been going on there for, for quite a number of years, but have kind of gained momentum, if you like, uh, quite recently, uh, due to a lot of the kind of exceptional uh, architecture and finds that have been uncovered. Uh, and in that aerial photograph there, you could just see the main excavation area. So the excavation is actually kind of divided into two main areas. We've got the, the trench here that you've probably seen in a lot of the, uh, the kind of uh, the National Geographic issue uh, and the photographs and not, whatnot, where we've got all of the, the beautiful standing architecture and buildings and a lot of the, the fantastic finds that have come out of there. We've also got Trench T, which has been uh, excavated over the past couple of years as well. And I'm actually looking at both parts of the site, and I'll kind of uh, do a little bit of comparison between those uh, as we go along. So just uh, in a little bit more detail, you can see the main excavation area. This particular building is the one that you might have uh, heard quite a lot about. It's actually uh, Structure 10, quite an exceptional uh, so-called monumental building, 25 metres long by 20 metres wide, 4 metre thick outer walls that are still standing uh, to a height of about 1 metre. Absolutely fantastic uh, place to work. Also, very well-preserved floor deposits and hearths and things uh, there as well. Uh, so, uh, as you um, may be aware, it was featured in National Geographic a few months ago, uh, perhaps on the basis uh, of some of these fantastic finds uh, that we've uh, recovered at the site, uh, things like this decorated stone, absolutely beautiful uh, painted uh, stone materials as well, beautiful uh, carved stone balls uh, and figurines and things as well. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk to you about any of the, uh, the kind of prettiest stuff, uh, shall we say. What I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, the rubbish, uh, the midden deposits um, at the Nessa Broadcare. So in addition to the, the really well-preserved architecture, we actually have a fantastic preservation of the midden deposits, so the, the rubbish heaps at the site um, as well. And I'm quite, a, as I'm sure as archaeologists, many of you are, quite a fan um, of rubbish deposits in archaeology because they can tell us um, a lot about resource use and activities that are going on uh, within uh, the settlements. And the reason that middens are so important is because they provide kind of this, this archive uh, for looking at how humans have interacted with the environment and with the landscape. And this project is very much concerned with how people are, are kind of using resources in the landscape. So this kind of two-way relationship, if you like, how people are actually having a, uh, using resources and having an impact on the environment, but also how the availability of things uh, within the landscape is actually impacting what people can do. And as part of the longer-term aims of this project, we're also hoping to do more comparative work with uh, the rest of Scotland, but also with southern Britain as well, places like Durrington Walls, where we also have uh, quite well-preserved midden deposits as well, thinking about the resources that are available in either northern versus southern Britain and how that influences what people are doing uh, and the sorts of... Uh, technologies that are developing as well. And this particular project that I'm talking about today is particularly focusing on fuel use uh, as a kind of indicator for environmental relationships. So what types of fuels were people actually using? Uh, were people using different types of fuels for different activities? Were different types of fuels perhaps being used at different types of the year or perhaps for different activities? So the first thing that I think uh, we might think of as archaeologists fuel use in the archaeological record uh, is wood charcoal. Obviously it's a major source uh, of information when we want to understand what people are burning. But as we also know there are a lot of taphonomic problems with just studying wood charcoal. Uh, even during its period of use, uh, charcoal is only representing quite a small fraction of what people were burning. It's transformed very readily to ash. Uh, so when we're just looking at the charcoal, it's only telling us about a very small fraction. And also we've got the, the preservation uh, issues with charcoal as well. Uh, in addition to that, and particularly relevant, obviously, for the Scottish uh, and the Orkney context, is people were burning other things apart from wood. Uh, peat, obviously, being very important. And other Neolithic sites, uh, um, kind of in other parts of the world as well, we see uh, animal dung is actually a very important source of fuel. Uh, and other sorts of materials, grasses and reeds and things, were also used as fuel. So how do we actually approach the study of these types of materials? And that is uh, where my own specialism comes in, uh, kind of microarchaeology, a sort of subset of geoarchaeology, if you like. 
it's kind of a catch-all term to describe uh, anything that is invisible to the naked eye, kind of uh, under, the, under the microscope, if you like. Uh, this integration of microscopic uh, and geochemical methods. And here's just some examples of different types of ash deposits under the microscope. So you've got kind of reeds uh, and grasses here. We've got a wood fuel with some reeds in it as well. And again, some reed microfossils uh, there as well. So it's a very uh, powerful tool to look at uh, deposits which appear quite either invisible or quite homogenous to the naked eye. Uh, so the main technique that we've been using uh, uh, up at the Nessa Broadcare is thin section micromorphology. Uh, not a technique that might not be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, this is a, a technique whereby we, we cut blocks of sediment uh, out of a section and take those back to the lab, set them in resin, and then we can cut a very thin slice from that and turn it into these things, uh, these microscope slides. So you can kind of zoom into the section, if you like, under the microscope to actually look at some of these uh, finely stratified deposits or things that, which might be difficult to identify by eye. So I always like to describe it as being... Ooh, so falling over there, um, an excavation under the microscope. So it's able, letting us take our section, if you like, and look at it under the microscope and kind of zoom in. So it's more than just actually looking at things in very high resolution. It's also a very useful linking tool to look at the relationships uh, between uh, different types of material. So thinking back to the example of charcoal, what of often happens, obviously, we do sieving, we do flotation. Someone gets the charcoal, someone gets the lithic, someone gets the pottery. Um, it's actually quite important, as you know, to try and bring these materials back together to in actually interpret the deposits. And micromorphology is a really good way of doing this because you can see in this example here, you can see all of these little black deposits, this microcharcoal. You can actually see the relationship between the different classes of materials. It's very powerful in terms of actually determining what type of activity we have. Uh, so in terms of fuel, whether it's a domestic fuel deposit, whether it's redeposited, whether it's a so-called kind of industrial type activity related to pottery production or something like that. Uh, and alongside the microscopic analysis, I'm just going to briefly mention, it's not something that we started yet, but we've got plans to do this in the future, is to integrate uh, the geochemical analysis as well. Uh, using techniques that are kind of developed to identify the, the origins of things like uh, volcanic ash, we can actually apply these to archaeology as well, which again, to try and get a, a kind of more detail about where different ash deposits are coming from in terms of fuel types. And just as a, a comparative example, uh, to kind of show you where this, this method uh, has been developed, or a lot of this method has been developed, um, a site that I worked on a number of years ago, another Neolithic site uh, a lot earlier, a Chathalhuyuk in Turkey, just to kind of give you the, le the level of inf information that we can get from this integrated approach. And you can see here is a, a thin section slide. This is 15 centimeters of stratigraphy. And you can already see the level of detail. And to think back to that idea of actually linking different lines of information, you can see we can look at our charcoal in conjunction with our ash deposits. And in this particular case, also look at the uh, embedded clay deposits as well. And this is a, a really good example of uh, how we can identify pottery production, um, uh, actual kiln deposits where we don't have things like slags and wasters uh, in the early Neolithic. And this is uh, showing that in this particular case, people were deliberately selecting animal dung uh, as a fuel for this particular activity. And that's quite different to what we see uh, in things like domestic hearths uh, and whatnot at that site. So these are the sorts of methods uh, that we're piloting um, at the Nessa Brodka. So we've been uh, working there for a couple of years I actually collected a, a huge amount of samples, about 60 samples, which is quite a, a significant number of large thin sections uh, in 2013 and 2014. Um, so as I said, uh, we've got samples from the main excavation area in Trench P, but also uh, Trench T, which I'll come back to in a moment. And the idea is to not just kind of look at the site as a whole, but to try to look at spatial variation within the settlement as well. Obviously, it's a, it's a, a very large site. We've got lots of different midden deposits. So it's also a really good opportunity to try and compare what's going on in different parts of the site uh, in terms of different activities that might be going on and whether they're perhaps linked uh, to different buildings and different uh, activities within buildings as well. So there's the... Uh, the, the three main midden areas that we're focusing on um, at the moment. We've got central midden and two kind of uh, offshoots as well. And what I'm going to do now uh, is just kind of show you lots of what I think are very pretty pictures uh, from under the microscope, just to kind of take you through some of the preliminary observations from the different midden areas and kind of explain the sorts of things that we can see under the microscope. So this is uh, section 246, the central uh, midden area. And this picture that you can see at the bottom here it's what I would call a kind of typical uh, midden deposit, if you like. All of this kind of brown ground mass is a very organic, rich material, lots of kind of mineral stuff in there as well. 
These black deposits that you can see at the top, that's burned peat residue, uh, which we were kind of ex uh, expecting. But also we've got a lot of uh, this sort of thing, very small fragments of degraded bone, a lot of which has actually been burned as well. Uh, and the particular deposit is quite interesting because um, hopefully even as non-micromorphologists, you can see that this looks quite different. So the, the typical uh, midden deposit looks something like that, but we also have episodes uh, with this sort of thing. And what you're looking at here is uh, a ground mass of, which is much less rich in organic material, is a much lower, uh, if any, abundance of bone and charcoal within that. But we do see a lot of these little white things, these little angular deposits, which are actually sand grains. Uh, and what we're looking at there is a, an episode where we've got a lot of kind of wind-blown sand uh, and exposure of the deposits. And it's quite a, a thick layer uh, within the midden. And it's suggesting that we've got initially a, a period where we've got fairly rapid build-up uh, of a dumping of midden material, followed perhaps by a period where that midden's stopped being used uh, for whatever reason. It's been exposed, and that's allowed uh, a lot of kind of wind-blown material uh, to build up in there. Okay, so moving on to one of the other midden areas, uh, section 682. Again, I'm sure uh, this kind of looks a bit like abstract art uh, to most people, but I'll just try and explain what we're looking at here. Hopefully you can see um, perhaps a little bit of similarity uh, to, the, to the other area. We've got a lot of this kind of homogeneous uh, brown organic rich material. Uh, again, you can see we've got these little fragments of uh, yellow stuff. That's, again, fragments of burnt bone or some of it's unburned as well. And again, a lot of uh, evidence for uh, peat turf burning uh, and whatnot in there as well. This um, section is quite interesting because we also see a lot of this stuff, which the color doesn't show up uh, particularly well in here, unfortunately. But this is, um, appears quite similar to what we've seen at other sites uh, where we've got burning of things like grasses and reeds and melted silica uh, particles. So if you burn uh, grasses and reeds and things at a high temperature, you get all of these kind of tiny silica slag deposits. So something a little bit different perhaps going on there, although we need to look in a bit more detail to actually try and figure out uh, whether it's something like uh, seaweed uh, perhaps as well. Uh, and again, we've got a lot of uh, this sort of material here, which is uh, probably uh, peat ash, some sort of ash. Again, we need to do some more uh, geochemistry to actually uh, identify that. And again, uh, the burnt bone fragments that you can see there as well. So similar in some ways, but with uh, some evidence of perhaps uh, something a little bit different uh, going on in some of the deposits uh, as well. Uh, another, <coughs> this is a, a very recent observation, so I was kind of going through these slides again. We actually see a lot of uh, phosphate-rich inclusions, uh, including this sort of thing, which uh, looks very much like a, an omnivore coprolite. Uh, and again, we need to do more geochemical analysis to identify that, to, uh, to see whether it's actually human or uh, some other omnivore but potentially telling us a bit more about uh, other sorts of activities uh, that might have been going on either in the middens or people dumping that sort of material uh, in there as well. Okay, so just to go to the, the final uh, part of Trench P, section 714. Uh, again, kind of, I'm not going to go into the, the kind of the technicalities of uh, the similarities and differences, but you can kind of see, uh, again, we've got this distinctive brown uh, ground mass deposit, kind of mixed uh, mineral and organic material. In this case, we've got um, ash being very intimately mixed uh, with uh, tiny fragments of bone. And it's unclear at this point whether this uh, either means that people are actually burning bone uh, as a fuel, uh, perhaps, or whether it's some sort of activity uh, that where kind of fragments of bone have become mixed, uh, cremation type activities, perhaps. As I said, uh, kind of preliminary observations at the moment, and we do need to, to do a bit more work on that. Um, also, we see uh, one of our rare fragments um, of charcoal uh, in this section, and we've got a couple um, of fragments of charcoal, not uh, in uh, too much abundance at all. Uh, this this section is also quite interesting. I didn't include a, a picture of this, but we also have a lot of uh, large fragments of burnt pottery uh, in kind of the middle layers um, of this particular midden, and we don't have very much bone in those at all, there's a lot of ash. And again, potentially related to uh, maybe pottery production, although this is something that really kind of needs to be integrated with the, the pottery analysis and the macro scale um, archaeology uh, as well. Okay, so just to have a, a kind of think then, what types of activities and what types of fuels are actually represented in the middens? And uh, obviously, uh, this is important, very important to integrate this with the macrobotanical analysis. Uh, which has been uh, done by Dr. Scott Timpany at UHI. And the interesting thing about our macrobotanical analysis is that despite over 1,000 uh, flot samples being analysed, we have an incredibly small uh, recovery of charcoal. 
And the charcoal that we do have uh, is things like heather and assemblages of weed seeds and other types of uh, seeds and whatnot. They're also indica indicative of turf burning, so fitting quite well with what we see uh, in the mycomorphology. Now, the important uh, and most difficult part, obviously, is actually trying to explain this. Um, is this scarcity of wood that we see uh, in the middens uh, due to the fact that wood is scarce in the landscape, or is it because people are deliberately selecting the turf um, rather than the wood, and why might that be? And it's quite interesting when we uh, think about the pollen records in Orkney, because I think it was kind of a, a traditional idea that it was a, a largely deforested uh, landscape in the Neolithic, but a lot of more recent pollen work has shown that this is uh, kind of an oversimplified view, and actually we've got uh, tree stands and whatnot uh, actually preserving into the Bronze Age. So we know that uh, there is wood, wood sources available, but people are not using them um, as fuel, as, as we can see so far uh, anyway. So what we are planning to do next, obviously uh, kind of uh, finish the, the 60 samples that, we are, um, that we've collected from Trench P, but also to uh, kind of expand into Trench T, uh, which is, you can just see the early stages of excavation here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Scott Pike who's doing a lot of the, the geochemical work. And try to get at that kind of spatial comparison. Can we distinguish uh, different midden types and different activities? And uh, Trench T is actually very different in some ways to the main excavation area. It's kind of actually been termed the midden mound because the entire thing appears to be one uh, huge midden deposit. <coughs> and it's at least uh, three meters deep and kind of follows, it's uh, further than the trench, obviously it goes all the way uh, down the slope just off the photograph there. And there's just a, a picture of uh, part of the section um, actually from, from Trench T. And you can see we've got all of these uh, midden deposits slumping uh, down the slope there. So in terms of sampling here, um, we're also trying to get at the, the spatial differences within the midden. Uh, with trench, uh, trench P, we've been looking at kind of variations over time within different midden areas. Here we want to try and get a sense of spatial differences. Is this one large kind of monumental event of dumping, uh, if you like, or is it composed of uh, several different uh, episodes um, of deposition? And obviously, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're also hoping to do uh, a series of geochemical uh, analyses uh, as well. So thin section micromorphology is a very powerful tool, but it's also uh, limited in some ways. There are only certain things that you can actually identify by eye. There's a lot of in kind of invisible information that we can get at from the chemistry. And the plan is to do, uh, we've got the subsamples for this, is to do lots of kind of geochemical spot sampling uh, throughout the sections as well to actually link the microscopic observations with geochemical fingerprinting as well, to see if we can resolve uh, some of these deposits in a bit more detail as well. Obviously, uh, the next stage as well, and I was hoping to be able to talk about this when I uh, kind of proposed the talk, but we haven't had the slides back yet. It's quite a, a time-consuming process, uh, is to, to start on the trench T samples as well. And obviously, the most difficult part of all is actually trying to link uh, the microarchaeology with the, the traditional macroscale analysis, which will be uh, an ongoing uh, process. And I'd just like to, to thank uh, um, all of these different funders and supporters of the project, uh, as well as uh, my collaborators, uh, and particularly uh, some of the beautiful aerial photography that you've seen uh, by Hugo uh, Anson Weimark and his fantastic uh, aerial kite photography. So thank you.